Cap Times Idea Fest 2020 is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors. Presenting sponsor, the Burrish Group at UBS, a financial services firm with global access and a local focus to pursue what matters most for its clients. Major sponsors are HealthX Ventures, backing entrepreneurs who are creating value with digital health solutions. Exact Sciences, pursuing earlier detections and life-changing answers in the fight against cancer. Quartz, health plans built with you in mind. And Madison Gas and Electric, your community energy company whose goal is net zero carbon electricity by 2050. Co-sponsors are Epic Systems and the Godfrey Kahn Law Firm. Other sponsors are Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, Home Savings Bank, Unity Point Health Meritor, Cargo Coffee, and the Forward Theater Company. Media partners are the Wisconsin State Journal and Madison.com, WKOW Channel 27, and Hinkley Productions. Please consider becoming a Cap Times member. Learn more at membership.captimes.com. Hi, I'm Katie Dean, Executive Editor of the Cap Times, and I'd like to welcome you to this year's Cap Times Idea Fest. This is our fourth annual event, but the first time we're presenting the festival virtually. Our theme this year is 2020 Changes Everything. With the COVID-19 pandemic, its effect on the health, education, and economic well-being of our community, as well as the calls for change from the Black Lives Matter movement, there's a lot to talk about. This year's lineup is our best yet. We believe IdeaFest has grown into a signature event on the Madison calendar. It is also an important showcase for the Cap Times, our locally owned and century old news publication. If you're not already, we hope you'll consider becoming a Cap Times member. As a member, you'll have access to special IdeaFest programs plus benefits throughout the year. You'll also be supporting an independent and trustworthy local media source at a critical time. Find the details online at membership.captimes.com. I'd like to thank the Burrish Group at UBS, which is the presenting sponsor of IdeaFest and has been with us since the start, as well as our numerous other sponsors. So please enjoy the session of IdeaFest. Thank you and welcome. Hi, I'm Cap Times K-12 education reporter, Scott Gerard. Today, our Cap Times IdeaFest panel will discuss how will COVID-19 change K-12 education? I'm lucky to have three wonderful panelists with me to help answer that question. Mary Lee McKenzie is a teacher at Middleton's Clark Street Community School, where she has worked since the school was in its planning stages. She's in her 11th year of teaching. Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings is a nationally recognized education expert who was a UW-Madison faculty member for more than 26 years, including as a professor in the departments of curriculum and instruction, educational policy studies, and educational leadership and policy analysis. She is also the current president of the National Academy of Education. Finally, Dr. Carlton Jenkins is the new superintendent of the Madison Metropolitan School District. He started the district's top job in August, coming from the Robbinsdale School District in Minnesota, where he worked for the past five years. Jenkins began his career in the Madison area, having worked in Beloit and at Memorial High School in the early 1990s before moving to various districts around the country. Thank you all so much for being here. Mary Lee, I'm going to start with you. You've been working with students directly throughout this pandemic. How has it gone both in the spring when changes were very sudden and then this fall with a summer to reflect and plan? It's been interesting for sure. Um, overall, I would say the it's been hard. There has been nothing about this where I've been like, oh, this really like, makes my life easy. Um, it's been really challenging and at the same time, the amount of growth and learning that we've been able to do as staff has been incredible. And I think about how teachers have moved from face-to-face -to, -face to online to then planning for a, a myriad of possibilities and then you know, ultimately not knowing where the next step might be. And so um, although it's been challenging and there has been so many times where there's been frustration or glitches or those kinds of pieces. I also have watched staff um, grow and blossom and try to make the best of a situation. Um, and 
I've also watched our district try to figure out, okay, how do we negotiate this? So it's been hard. <laughs> there's there's no, no way around that. And um, I also think we are learning and positioning ourselves to make some bigger changes down the road. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jenkins, you've spoken about how the transition to virtual learning went in Robbinsdale when you were there this spring. What lessons did you learn from that experience that you were able to bring here in Madison as you started the job with just a month until the school year began? Well, um, there were a lot of lessons out of this. The first one, the whole idea that the science is real. Um, we initially uh, sent out a communication about COVID-19 February the 6th in our district, and then again in February the 28th, and we were watching what was coming out of Hopkins in terms of the information CDC, but it was from afar. But when it hit us and we had the initial um, case in our district, even though we had read up on it, it was real. And so in terms of all of your plans, when you have a crisis that we've done before, we've had crisis in schools, but nothing like this. Things we had talked about doing way out five years, 10 years from now with technology, we talked about it. We've been talking about building our infrastructure. We went from being the first district to close in the state of Minnesota, thinking we were closing for two days to disinfect, right? And we'll be right back to now the real reality of what we're going through. But the lessons we learned in this in terms of how much we depend on one another and how much we need our children to be in close proximity to us. Our realization of the children who are behind uh, during the traditional schools were just illuminated 10 times, you know, uh, more that, wow, we really need to do a better job of trying to engage not only children, but the families. This went from a just totally child-centered to a whole family, whole community. And so COVID-19 for us has said, let's pause and check on the social emotional well-being, the mental health aspect and understanding our community even deeper because the economic, the employment, the health, all these things that happen. So as a staff, we had to change our delivery models for instruction. Uh, initially in the crisis, we were trying to put in to our model the same things we were doing in traditional schools. That did not work, uh, and we learned from our students and our staff and our community, we needed to change it and not be so much as just on the social emotional that we didn't continue to try to continue with the high levels of instruction. But initially, we were just thrown off guard. I'm gonna be honest with you, and over the summer, you know, we worked together to really come up with a model that we think is better, but we're not done. We're still learning. Even being here in Madison now to transition, um, Madison staff did a lot in terms of uh, just like across the country, people were taking food out to the community, getting uh, devices out in the community, getting hot spots out. And we were not prepared for that level of support that we needed to give. But I was amazed at how all the staff in the community came together to try to get those things done. Yeah, I still remember the lack of sureness around the closures and how long it would be here. I talked to a number of teachers who said bye to their students for two weeks and then right. it ended up being the whole <laughs> yeah. semester. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Ladson Billings, this summer you were involved in a program at Penn Park that had some students outdoors learning STEM lessons uh, for three days a week. What were the most important aspects of that sort of programming this summer for you? Well, I think Dr. Jenkins actually hit upon uh, what was central for me. I know that people are, are concerned about learning loss or learning uh, opportunities, missed learning opportunities, but first, let's be clear. Our children are learning all the time. They are human beings. There is no time when they are not learning. Well, maybe when they're asleep, they're not learning, but they're always learning. Now, whether they're learning academic things or curricular-based things, that's something different. But what I was really focused on in developing that program, and we called it Smartly in the Park, um, I knew that the, the STEM attraction would be there for the wider community. But my focus was on the children's social, emotional, and mental health needs. So many of our kids are isolated. 
They, you know, they got a parent who was trying to go to work who says you may not leave the house. Okay, you got to stay here. And we figured that out when we started this, uh, with the lunches. Kids weren't coming to get the lunches because they were told don't leave the house. So uh, at Mount Zion, one of the things we did is we got, we got the van together, we collected the lunches and we delivered them. So I said, this can't be good for our kids to be this isolated. So, you know, the, we did not have sort of assessment metrics or any of those things in place for this summer. What it was, was the opportunity for kids to be in face-to-face -face communication with one another and with caring adults. And I think that's what we're learning in this whole process. We can talk about curriculum, we can talk about instruction, but we are in the human being business. We don't have the human beings, we have no business. And so indeed, until we meet those basic needs, those social, emotional, and mental health needs, we are, we're not gonna be successful. And I think those were really underscored uh, as, as spring went on and into the summer. Thank you very much. And that actually leads into another question I have here. Uh, all of you have spoken to me or publicly about social emotional learning being as important right now uh, as academic learning. But how can that be done through a screen? Um, I'm going to start with Mary Lee just because you've been trying to do that with your students. Um, so there's a number of ways to do it. Um, it would be a misnomer to think that all of our students were showing up to school on a daily basis when we were seeing them face to face. And so as teachers, as staff members, we've developed ways of connecting with students beyond the physical classroom to begin with, right? But there's also ways to do that in front of a screen, right? Taking the time to check in with students. Yeah, I have 50 minutes with my group of students. But guess what, I spend that first five, 10 minutes at least checking in. Maybe it's a silly question. What's your favorite fall activity to do or fall flavor, right? It could be something silly like that, but it also could be something of like, how are you right now? Where are you at? Um, and then on top of that, it's meeting students where they're at. Some of our students, I have students who are not ready to do a Zoom meeting. It's too much for them they, in a number of ways. So guess what, I'm doing phone calls. I'm text messaging. I'm finding ways to connect with them in, in lots of different ways. Do I wish that I could be face to face with them? Absolutely, 100%. And we are, we are finding ways to make those small connections that then lead to being able to open up to bigger connections. And trying to provide some space during our class time or whatever you know, synchronous time that we have to also let them talk with each other because like Dr. Latson Billings said, our kids are isolated in their houses and some of them haven't seen peers or reached out to peers. So creating some structures and spaces to have some of those conversations, to be able to have, engage in that discussion that would happen in a classroom and you know, creating those spaces. Dr. Jenkins, what are you hearing from staff and, and what are staff doing in Madison to foster those sorts of things? First of all, let me just say thank you, Mary. I mean, she really spoke to what I'm hearing from a number of our staff, and uh, not just here in Madison, but just throughout the country as I'm meeting with other superintendents regularly on a national level to talk about what we can do to continue to build these relationships. And funny, we go back to Dr. Lassen Billings when she started talking about culturally relevant pedagogy, and I always looked at that in terms of relationship building. And that's what Mary was talking about. So way before everyone else was talking about it, Dr. Lassen Billings has been talking about this whole thing of relationship, relationship. And we talk about relationships, but the reality of relationships, as Mary just described, that's where our teachers are. Another thing in terms of uplifting the voices of the teachers, all of the assessments, some individuals think that we still need to be hard on the AP exam, hard on the ACT. That's not the main thing right now. The main thing is that we put our arms around our students, around our staff, around our community. We see one another and we uplift the voices of the students and of the staff. How are they really experiencing this new thing? Taking those voices in the emphasis of our planning. In the past, a lot of times we have done the planning from my office, all the other offices. The hierarchy that we've known must be flipped up on its head right now. 
that has not even worked during the traditional for all children. Serve some children well, but not all children. This is the time that we're saying, before you start the lesson, ask a simple question, but a big question. How are you today? And then pause and listen, okay? And so our staff intentionally, when we design our lessons and coming back and looking at how we get students in groups, how we listen to them individually, how we let students talk to students. And we have to be very careful about um, just doing the content at this time. But at the same time, our students, they want the structure. They need the structure to help them have some sense of what am I to do today? Parents need it. The other thing we're doing, trying to connect more with parents. And for us, we're finding that we're actually having more contact with some parents than what we did prior to COVID, in particular, black and brown families. We have the one group that's been disengaged before COVID. That's even more now, particularly with black and brown and special needs students. But right now, at this time, we're trying to make sure we have that additional communication for those students who have been most marginalized prior to COVID and now during COVID. And so I think those things, uh, and students know we're paying attention to them. Staff know that we're hearing their voices. Parents know that we're hearing their voices and then being prepared to pivot. Right now, we're in the middle of making shifts from what we've learned even since school started back. Our early learners, we have to define what does screen time mean? How are we approaching our earliest learners, our ELL students? How do we give them the support? How do we support our students who may be special needs, and just students who may be having anxiety and social emotional issues, and staff. So that's what we're trying to do to build a relationship, see people, and then actually serve them based on their needs, and then provide the overall support uh, systematically, not just in an isolated classroom. How will all of our teachers interface with our students now? That's what we're doing. Thank you so much for detailing all of that. Dr. Ladson Billings, what sorts of best practices are you seeing on social emotional learning right now? So, you know, it's interesting. There is an instructional practice that we had before all of this called the flipped classroom. And it suggests that a lot of the learning take place online and then you come face to face to do sort of minimal things. Well, I'm seeing that we're having flipped relationships. And what do I mean by that is the this, this stuff that we're worried about in terms of communicating electronically, our kids already know how to do that. They can sit in a room right next to their best friend and they're not talking, they're texting them. It's become their way of communicating. So we can learn some things from them and not presume that we have to be the ones who are telling them. Uh, I, I went and visited a class, you know, visit as in electronic and in Baltimore, and I asked the kids uh, what they liked or didn't like about uh, virtual learning. And one kid said, oh, I love it. He said, because when she gets on my nerves, I just turn her off. He said, he said I couldn't do that when, when I was in the class. We had to sit there and listen. So it's interesting that the way that they are adjusting and adapting. Um, and I think we can take some hints from them. Uh, no, we don't want everybody on screens all the time. I think we're all sick of that. But I do think we can be a lot more creative with it. And, and what I will say, and I think, you know, thinking of, of Dr. Jenkins sitting there, I think that we're having a diff, totally different relationship with our IT departments. That before they were this group on the side, they were the resource people. If my internet goes down, if I can't get my email, I call them. They're, they've moved to the center. And we are now in a partnership with them, which is the way it should have been, that they should have been our instructional technology folks, as opposed to information technology on the side. So I think we're learning a lot of how to improve education uh, as a result of this. Thank you so much. Uh, are any of you concerned about the screen time for students right now? <laughs> Does anyone want to talk yeah. about how they're trying to manage that? Well, interesting you ask that question because that's been our conversation the last several weeks from parents, from students and staff, uh, and on our team. First of all, we need to redefine what the screen time and all the research prior to COVID. We need to look at that research with a critical eye because 
you may be on a Zoom and as what Dr. Les Billinger just said, the kid may be there and may be working independently. It's on, but you're working independently. You're not just interfacing eyes and concerned about um, whether or not the students engage from a visual straight up point. It just may be on. And so we need to define it first of all, and that's what we've been talking about. But we do need to pay attention to our learners, earliest learners, you know, our four and five year olds and what can they really manage? And do we want them to be in such a structured environment, whereas they're not being able to be them, uh, be independent uh, learners because students can learn independent in, in what some would call it unstructured environment. I say playtime. Playtime is very important. So we need to think about it on levels of primary and secondary. Now, secondary students, they're on it, but they're doing it in a totally different way than what our early learners. And so we just need to be respectful of that. And that goes back to listening to the student. And sometimes they can't manage as much as we were trying to, we we're trying to give them. We have, the pendulum have swung from last spring not being as much, and people say, hey, we want more, to I think sometimes now we've gone a little too far. And we need to engage the students, hear their voice, engage the teachers. The most important thing right now is to engage that teacher. Those formative assessments will allow us to know how we need to pivot uh, along with engaging the voices of the students. That's, that's where we are with it. What about you for high schoolers, Mary Lee? I mean, screen time is a conversation that we have with our high schoolers, even when we're face to face in the building, of how much time are they spending on their Chromebook in the classroom? Um, because it's still a lot. It, and then we expect them to go home and do homework. And that, a lot of times, is on the Chromebook or on a computer or on their phones. And then you bring in the phone piece. So our, a lot of times, my high schoolers are definitely multitasking with a phone in one hand and a Zoom meeting in the other. Yeah. And we've had some really good conversations about that. Um, because as we kind of go back to that social emotional learning, the high school students, and not that the elementary aren't either, but like the high school students are searching and seeking that social connection. And right now, it's the device, it's the phone that brings that social connection right. at an even higher level than it already did, even beyond you know students sitting next to each other and texting <laughs> each other. Like there's, there's so much more there. Um, I don't know if there's a good answer for, for any of that, I think we have to keep learning. I think we have to keep a critical eye of thinking about how can we make our screen time meaningful and how can we also pull off the screen? How can we get creative and pull off of the screen and get kids back outside? I think of the STEM program that Dr. Leds and Billings talked about of being outside working. Um, one benefit we've had is we've had students in our uh, community garden that we have outside of our school. And I look at that and seeing that has been amazing, um, that they are engaging with um, the food chain and how things are produced and you know how can we build that into schools all over, not just at school, but in their homes, in their communities, mm -hmm. and connecting there. Dr. Ladson Billings, I know screen time was a concern and part of the reason that you were so happy with the program this summer that was outdoors. W what are your thoughts on students avoiding too much screen time? So earlier this um, year, well, I, probably late, late, late summer, as we were thinking about going back to school, I did a workshop for a, a local bank that has branches in Milwaukee and Green Bay. And because a lot of those uh, employees Said, you know, I still have to work, but what about my kids? And so we had a really good conversation and I literally helped them build the schedule for whether it was elementary, middle or high school. And I built into that schedule, like stop and go outside. Like that, that was like written mm -hmm. there. Because uh, one of the things that we are forgetting is that, you know, as human beings, we, we are mind, body and, and spirit. We're not just minds. And so this is an opportunity to literally say, it's important that you get some exercise. I talked to, to the parents about having more than one place in their home for their kids to be engaged in their learning. So yeah, maybe the, the den or their room is where they might do English or, or 
literacy or reading and mathematics, but maybe it's the kitchen table or the kitchen island where you're going to do the craft activity and then get outside, you know, minimum amount of time. We need the very things that we need to do in a well-developed face-to-face program, we still can keep going uh, modified at home. We want to make sure that our kids are taking care of their bodies. Um, you know, one of the unanticipated uh, results of this pandemic is that a number of our high school students are, are taking jobs. And we hadn't thought about that. Um, Mary Lee talked about knowing that that some of the kids are not checking in. They're not checking in because they're working. Uh, and they're adding hours if they already had a job. So they need to be active. They need to minimize the amount of time that they have to be in front of those screens because um, they're drawn to them anyway. Um, it, my generation was drawn to the TV. And back then it was like the television producers had enough sense to turn us off at midnight. It's like we couldn't watch no more. But we are, you know, we're in, in a generation in which people getting most of their information through the screen. So we've got to break it up and make it uh, an opportunity for them to also get their bodies uh, moving and so that they just don't, you know, sedentary um, activity is what leads to all this sort of heart disease and diabetes and things like that. So we don't want to set them up for um, a negative future. Well, may I have one other part about that? And I know we're talking about the students' screen time. We've also been talking about we're wrestling as adults. When do we begin our day? When does our day end? So we've got to have more calibration around this whole moment we're in. It seems like there's no ending to it. We did have a set time doing traditional, but now you're at that desk, you're in your space working from early morning to late at night. So we have to recalibrate on that. And I think as we think about ourselves, that will help influence what we're doing with our students. Realizing too, as you mentioned about the phones constantly going, and if we don't do that, as Dr. Lassabillick said, it impacts our health when our minds never shut down. And that's whole about the whole sleep time study, and that's another discussion, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great point. I mean, Mary Lee, how, how has that been for you as a teacher, wanting to connect with students but trying to live your own life? Well, and I, I thank you for bringing that up. I really appreciate it um, because I do think as teachers, we spend a lot of time thinking about our students' screen time and then we're not necessarily reflecting on how exhausted we are and understanding why that is. Um, I, I taught online before online was the cool thing to do. And so I had to learn that. I was, I was balancing both teaching some face-to-face, -face, some online. And when I first started teaching that online piece, I realized I was working all hours of the day and I was responding to emails at eight o'clock at night and at 5.30 in the morning. And I realized I had to set some boundaries for myself. And as a community of staff members, we haven't, we haven't, I don't think we've gotten there yet because we feel like there's so much to do and we're learning and trying to stay on top of so many things. And I, as I, I think about our staff, um, yesterday we were in a professional development and we, we did try to take some times to take a break but it just becomes all consuming. And um, I appreciate Dr. Jenkins thinking about the staff and how, yes, we might be teaching face-to-face, -face, or not face-to-face, -face, but on Zoom, synchronous, you know, from nine to two, but guess what? Our job doesn't end there. And so then we're on the computer on a screen beyond those hours, a lot of times, many hours beyond those hours. And so, um, and, I think we are, we're learning and we're gonna hopefully get into a place where we've gotten through the first term, we've started to realize, okay, here's some strategies that really work and how we can set some of those boundaries. Thank you both for speaking to that aspect of this. One of the th other pieces that we've spoken about, Mary Lee, is that sort of this time has illustrated that no learning system is gonna work for everyone, including virtual, but, but I think uh, a lot of people assumed the other system was just the way it was, but this has highlighted that it's not gonna work universally. 
How can education move forward with that understanding that not all systems work for every student? Um, I'll actually start with Dr. Ladson Billings on this one. So now you, you that you've um, tossed me a nice softball because it's kind of what I've been talking about all along <laughs> uh, since we've been in the pandemic. And I've suggested that um, this is an opportunity for us to do what I've called a hard reset. And I've actually used the analogy of the devices that we all have, uh, that when they don't work, um, we, you know, try some things, we take the SIM cards out, put them back in, the battery out, put it back, they don't work, they don't work, and we, we, we head off to the store, whether it's the Apple store, the Samsung store, the Android, wherever you got your device, and somebody who's about 17 years old wearing a t-shirt tells you the dreaded words, we're going to have to do a hard reset. And what they mean by that is if you haven't backed up everything, when they give you that phone back, all your contacts are going to be gone. All your pictures are going to be gone. Wherever you were in the candy crush things going to be gone. You're going to have a phone that's like it was when it came to you from the factory. And that's really where I believe we are in education. I don't think we can, you know, when people say, I can't wait to get back to normal. Well, normal for the kids that I'm most concerned about was a disaster. Normal was they weren't reading. Normal was that they were being suspended at a, a disproportionate rate. Normal was they were over-identified for special education. Normal was they were being expelled. Normal was they weren't getting an advanced placement. So with the hard reset, we have this opportunity, you know, I've, I've been citing an Indian novelist by the name of Arundhati Roy, who says this, the pandemic is a portal. It's a gateway from the old world into the new. And that we have an opportunity. I know we're all talking about how horrible this is, but I want to say that it's also an opportunity. It's also a chance for us to have a clean slate, to think differently about what we're doing, to focus differently. I've got a panel coming up uh, next week with the National Academy. And one of the things I'm going to say is that we need to center science. And I'm not just saying science curriculum, but the problems of living in a democracy, whether it is climate change, whether it's economic downturn, whether it's the inability for people to access a quality education, that if we center the problems, then the curriculum will come along. Because you know, you, you can't make a case if you're not literate, right? So I don't want you just to read because I want you to have a set of skills. I want you to be able to solve a problem. So I just think, yeah, I can't remember whether it was Rahm Emanuel or some political person who said we should never um, let, you know, not take advantage of a good crisis. Well, we got a good crisis here and we need to take advantage of it. Mary Lee, how can you bring that idea of systems not universally working for every student into teaching? Uh, so I, I've been really lucky. Um, I work at Clark Street Community School. We have started this step. We've gotten rid of grades, not standards based, not one, two, three, four. Like we have truly, there is no GPA, there is no grades. We are mastery based. So we're actually looking at when you write something or when you read something or when you do some math work, we're looking at that and saying, okay, where can you improve? Where have you really mastered this skill? That kind of piece. Um, we've looked at how do we look at personalized plans for students and how are the students taking the lead on that plan? What do they want to do? What do they want to pursue? I do think this, I, I cannot second enough what Dr. Ladson Billings is saying is this is such an opportunity that we can start saying maybe one size doesn't fit all and here is our chance to actually make those changes. That maybe we don't need all of our students in our building at the same time in order for them to be growing and learning. Maybe we can connect with our communities. I think of um, what Dr. Jenkins was saying about how you know the outreach and the connection with community centers and community groups, maybe we need to make that the norm as compared to just the crisis situation. So I think there's so many different opportunities within that to say, huh, 
turns out when we take some of these pieces away, not everything falls apart. And maybe we are actually seeing students grow and seeing students thrive in, in a way that we haven't seen before. Dr. Jenkins, how can a, a whole school district embrace those ideas, do you think? I think it's uh, critical that we all pause and look at what we have in terms of COVID-19 intersecting with the whole racial injustice um, since the infancy of our country. For me, when I publicly witnessed Mr. Floyd being lynched 16.2 miles from my home, um, a moment as an educator of 30 years, I said, I'm not doing my job. I'm not being disruptive enough. It came full circle, the historical wrongs of black and brown, poor children, special needs children. And I'm saying, what can we do? That was the question I asked. And I said, it's time that we go back and look on the promise of America, of America, and hold America accountable, but it's reciprocal accountability. We have to do our parts and America must do their parts. We're fundamentally flawed, no matter which system we try to implement right now, we're fundamentally flawed how we resource education. We need to make education the main thing. And when I say resource, see, it's not just money, it's the resources, be it human, be it an opportunity for advancement once an individual become educated. This is an opportunity for us to hold America true to his promise when Abraham Lincoln said we came together to form a more perfect union. This is the time to form a more perfect union and to be all inclusive. Put the schools in the community and hold the community accountable. Put the, uh, the, the community in the schools and hold the schools accountable. It's a shared responsibility. It's not just schools, it's businesses, it's health care. It's all about the employment. And I just think regardless of where we stand, which system, if we don't see the people, and if we don't have a service mentality about the people, right, and trying to support the people, and we develop policies that impact our practices, that impact the people, that are still not taken into that promise, we are Americans. I think this is the greatest opportunity in my time in education. It's like I've had a rebirth. I consider myself as a first-year educator right now not superintendent, drop the titles. That's nonsensical. Drop the titles and let's just come together and do the work. Whichever system we design, make sure it's one of excellence and not non-excellence. I think critically, when we say excellence, excellence is not some children reading at 18% and other children reading at 64%. And we're trying to compare the students black and brown students to white students who are scoring at 64%. 64% does not put us on the competitive level internationally. That's the very reason in math and science we had 32 and 34 in terms of our rating when you look at the performance of international student assessment. This is an opportunity for America to really lead how America can lead. And I truly believe with the great science that's here in Madison, number one public institution, share parking lots with MMSD. Share parking lots. There's no reason that we can't come together, take the science, take the practice, listening to the students, listen to the staff, and listen to the community. Whichever system we come up with, we come up with it together, and it's all in. That's what I believe that we have to do, and the system that we choose must maintain a human perspective and not just test outcome perspective. Thank you all very much for that, per, those perspectives. Uh, we need to take a quick break here and we'll be back to talk more about teaching and learning going forward. Cap Times Idea Fest 2020 is made possible by the generous support of our sponsor. Presenting sponsor, the Burrish Group at UBS, a financial services firm with global access and a local focus to pursue what matters most for its clients. Major sponsors are HealthX Ventures, backing entrepreneurs who are creating value with digital health solutions. Exact Sciences, pursuing earlier detections and life-changing answers in the fight against cancer. Quartz, health plans built with you in mind. And Madison Gas and Electric, your community energy company whose goal is net zero carbon electricity by 2050. 
Co-sponsors are Epic Systems and the Godfrey Kahn Law Firm. Other sponsors are Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, Home Savings Bank, Unity Point Health Meritor, Cargo Coffee, and the Forward Theater Company. Media partners are the Wisconsin State Journal and Madison.com, WKOW Channel 27, and Hinkley Productions. Please consider becoming a Cap Times member. Learn more at membership.captimes.com. Welcome back to our panel on how COVID-19 will change the future of education. So one of the things I think a lot of students and adults are facing right now through this pandemic is uncertainty uh, in their lives. How can teachers and uh, educational institutions help students through that uncertainty uh, while also managing you know, their, their own uh, challenges? Mary Lee, I'll start with you. Um, I think it starts with going back to the question of how are we approaching social emotional wellness? How are we looking at the wellness needs of our students, of our families, and of our teachers? Um, I think we have spent a lot of last spring, early this fall saying, okay, we're gonna check the box on making sure our kids are okay. And I, I do have some concern that we're gonna you know, get further in and be like, oh, well, we already checked that box, so we don't need to continue to do that. And that's where I think parents and staff members and students and administration and the greater community can help continue to check in, to keep that pulse. Um, we're gonna head into winter here soon, whether or not the weather today actually looks like that. Um, and that's going to change the dynamic. And so as we continue through these different phases, as the data changes, as different events come through in the next few months, we need to continue to check in um, because the uncertainty is not going away, not for a while. And the more that we are being aware of the mental health needs, the more that we continue to message to families that the wellness of your family is of the utmost importance. Yes, we want students learning, we want students growing, and they're gonna continue to do that especially when they are well, especially when they have levels of security. And that could look like a lot of different things, whether that's a schedule. I love how Doc, Dr. Latson Billings talked about working with families of how do you do a schedule? How do you actually make a schedule? I'm going, I wonder if we've done that with our parents. I don't know if we have. We've talked with some of our high school students about doing that, but that might be really great for our elementary students to think about how do you actually set up a schedule? As teachers, I'm really skilled at that. It's what I live in, right? Like that's my world that I live in. Not everybody lives in that world. So as we continue on, we have to continue doing those checkpoints. We can't just check a box and say that we're moving forward. Dr. Jenkins, on that similar note, I mean, how can the district give parents and students certainty right now? I think right now we have to truly just be honest with the community. We're in a state of uncertainty, and it's all about how you view it. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's the end of the world because we're uncertain. We give you as much information as we can based upon the information we're getting. But I'm also really pushing for parents and for staff to be very careful about what information coming to you. An example, there is uh, an economist out of Harvard, Shetty. He just put this piece out based upon his metrics, uh, really with following the Zern online curriculum about Wisconsin and the high socioeconomic students have increased learning 83.3% on the Zern online curriculum. And the lower socioeconomic students have decreased by 1%. So we know we have gaps. We're Wisconsin, number one in the nation, right? But what does this type of data mean, information when you get it? It continues to perpetuate narratives of someone else versus trying to understand your own realities. And so that narrative individual may take it. Do we even use the Zern curriculum in all of Wisconsin? No, but right now the narrative is these are the things that's happening. So know the information and from where it comes, know the metrics, do your homework as much as you can to be in alignment with the, the guidance that's coming out, 
we're in a medical situation, the academic piece, and I wholeheartedly agree with Dr. Lassen, Bill, our students are learning, right? To the staff, I'm saying, hey, give yourself some space and grace and give the students some space and grace. You didn't turn it in by two o'clock. Nope, zero. Hold up. Wait a minute. That kid was at home helping three of their siblings. You don't know all the situation. Ask questions before we make those final decisions. Same thing to parents, in particular parents who are working and have children at home. Give yourself some space and grace. Give your students some space and grace. And uh, one of my former um, people, uh, student services uh, supervisors, she said that to our team, because when we first started, we were in a crisis. She said, hold up everybody. Well, let's just give some space and grace. And I really embraced that philosophy of saying, you're not gonna be perfect. I'm not gonna be perfect but we're just striving to do better. And, and as long as we can understand that we're gonna to strive to get better, you don't have to be perfect. That's the other thing too, right? As long as we know our intent and we're really working hard to get there, I think we'll be a little bit better off. But that adds to the social emotional, I have to be perfect. I've had to have more psychologists talking to our 4.0 students over time because of the anxieties they have. Wait a minute, I, I just scored a 97 on that test. Oh my goodness, I didn't get 100, hold up, slow down. <laughs> you know, that wasn't all that bad, you know? And that's not low expectation, but it's just saying relax, you know? And we're all gonna have to do that, help one another uh, do that. And I think we'll be better off. The anxieties are real amongst all of us right now. Dr. Ladson Billings, how can uncertainty and you know, disruption to routine affect kids' learning um, and development? Um, so I think what's important for us to understand is even though this panel is about COVID-19, we are in the midst of four readily identifiable pandemics. We do have COVID-19. It's the reason why, you know, people are distancing while I'm here and not in the studio with you. We, we understand that one. But we're also in a pandemic of anti-Black racism. That, that's everywhere. I mean, it was George Floyd and Aubrey, um, Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor, and then lo and behold, Jacob Blake, I mean, right down the road in Kenosha. So that's all around too. But we also are facing a terrible economic situation. We haven't talked much about it, but the truth of the matter is that um, even though the governor has you know, had uh, landlords stay, the requirement for people to pay their rents, those rents are gonna come due and people don't have jobs or they've had to cut hours. So rents and mortgages and all those things will come down, come, come due. And then the fourth one, although we think of ourselves as kind of safe from it in the uh, upper Midwest, is the coming climate catastrophe. You know, I'm a grandmother who all of her grandchildren are, are on the West Coast. So they can't even go outside because the, the air is so bad. So those fires raging in California, or if you live in that um, in the in the Gulf Coast area, uh, we are now through all of the regular alphabet with storms, and now into the Greek alphabet. Louisiana is bracing for uh, the Delta, right? So all of these things are happening. So uncertainty is not just around COVID nineteen; mm -hmm. it's around living in this world right now. So one of the things that I think will help us with the uncertainty is that as teachers, we have to begin to build our pedagogical repertoires. COVID-19 has forced you to do it to some extent. You can't just do the same old stuff. Uh, I recall as a professor at UW, because you know, unlike um, K-12 school, and we don't get a room, you know, you don't have a room that's your room. You have your office, but you teach wherever they assign you, wherever there's space. And I had made a decision that whatever space I'm in, I'm going to take advantage of whatever, whatever resources are there. So my last couple of rooms were connected to our IMC, which meant I had all of this technology. I had smart boards. I had docu-cams. I had uh, all kinds of listening. And, and I decided to start doing some things differently. I began to run a, um, a, a a class hashtag, a Twitter feed, 
And what did I find out? That many of my international students absolutely loved it because they don't like raising their hands and speaking out because that's not how they, they came into education in their countries. But they can pull out their devices and tweet about what we're doing. I would not have thought about that without that resource there in front of me. So I think the, again, you know, I wanna look at the opportunities. So the opportunities are for us to build um, better uh, pedagogical repertoires to learn to teach together. That's another thing that I think we, we, we give lip service to team teaching, but I think now we do have to work together. Uh, and that as Dr. Jenkins had said earlier, the whole notion of the community and the school and the school and the community, that, that, that gives us another opportunity. Uh, Mary Lee talked about a community garden. Um, we could be doing so many more things uh, and not letting the assessment tail wag the dog here that uh, I just want to, I just don't want us to, to lose this opportunity, to miss it, because it really is uh, an opportunity. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Jenkins, Dr. Latson Billings just spoke a lot about teacher development and growth and learning right now. What are you doing as an administrator to learn and grow through this period of time? JFK said that leadership and learning are indispensable. You can't be a leader without wanting to continue to grow. And I am listening a whole lot more to everyone. Uh, and what I'm hearing from the children uh, when I go out in the community, when I'm going and tapping into the schools, when I'm meeting yesterday with the principal group, and what, uh, when I'm listening to the parents, when I say I'm in my first year of my new education as a leader, this is my first year, and it's exciting. It's given, it's rejuvenated me in a way as a learner, you know, reading uh, in and everything, because there is not a blueprint for this where we are now. So as I walk through it and looking at the models, not of what has been, but what could be, I think what Dr. Lassen Bill has said, this is an opportunity. I, I, I am in that mode of saying this is the learning should be occurring for myself, trying to educate, also working in collaboration with our board, working with the staff, and yesterday, the principals, we had a great conversations, and we're gonna flip our model. Central office bring in all the experts. Central office come in and lead. No, 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 no. Principals will lead the PD. They were gonna come up with the topics and working in concert with the staff. And, um, I met with some amazing principals yesterday. We have so much talent in MMSD. I just, I mean, I've been in a lot of places and I knew that when I left and it's still here. So that's what I say as a, as a new leader, you know, I am in a learning mode and I think I've been rejuvenated by this COVID-19, by this racial, the whole injustice piece. So I think that's what, from my level and lens, we have to do, throw out what we were before this and start anew. Yeah, and sort of to build on that, are there any you know, specific curricular or content changes that you see happening as a result of everything that's going on right now, Mary Lee? I mean, do you plan to build any of what's been going on in the world into your content going forward? We are. <laughs> that's <laughs> the really amazing part. Um, so the school that uh, I work at, um, we've been doing this for almost 10 years now of looking at um, how do we bring what students are already passionate about? How do we bring what is already um, in both popular culture, in the news, in science, and bring it into our focus? So right now our students are split into two cohorts. One cohort is working on a, um, the theme is growing, your, growing our future. So looking at food sustainability, planetary health, looking at philosophy, how does philosophy impact how we, we um, interact with the world? Poetry, so how can poetry and within that hip hop and language be impactful for communicating your ideas? So that's our one strand. And so we have a group of teachers who are then working with our half of our students um, for this entire first term interspersing all of those ideas. 
I'm in the coming of age. So thinking about what does it look like to come of age both in this time and in times all over the world, right? So thinking about it from a global perspective and right here in our community. So what are we looking at? What are we doing? How do we look at statistics and use that to inform our, our decisions that we're making? How do we use literature to have that windows and mirrors effect, right? What do I see in literature that is similar to me? What is literature that opens my eyes to different pieces? Um, so I've been really lucky that I've been doing this for many years now. And I think we are now, we have an opportunity to say, how can we use what is happening in our world right now? If you take any of the pandemics that Dr. Ladson Billings talked about, you could develop curriculum for years on those topics alone. And we have an opportunity to do that. We have the materials, we have the ideas out there, but it's going to take a massive shift. It's a massive shift to shift away from what we've been doing to what we can do. And I think this might be the time. And yes, it's going to be hard, but it's already hard. So what, what are those steps that we can start taking as we look at that? Dr. Ladson Billings, how important do you think it is for teachers to do that sort of uh, curricular adjustment uh, for their students? Um, I think it's imperative. You know, it's interesting. Some years ago, um, psychologist Howard Gardner, who most people know from multiple intelligences, Howard said, you know, we keep talking about what schools need to do or what, you know, how, how to get better. He said, the truth of the matter is, if you look around the world, there are different places in the world that are expert at different aspects of it. He said, if you wanted to have a child have a perfect education, you put them in preschool in Italy at Reggio Emilia. You put them in elementary school in Finland. You then put them in high school in Germany, and then you send them to college in the United States. That indeed, that, that, that's where the best systems seem to be. So we have this opportunity to look, well, what, what's going on at Reggio Emilia? How can our preschools be less sort of structured and focused and more whole child oriented? Mm -hmm. What's going on in Finland? Why are the Finns doing so well in elementary school? Uh, how much latitude do their teachers have to make curricular decisions? What's going on in Germany uh, with high school? Well, one of the things I know for sure is that German high school offers a promise. If you stick through this, this is what we're promising you at the end. So they've sat down with industry and, and post-secondary ed and said, if your people come through the program, we guarantee them a route to one of these. They wanna go work in the Mercedes Benz plant, they can do that. But if they wanna go to Bologna uh, to study, they can do that. And then of course, our colleges are the cream of the crop. Everybody comes here. Everybody wants to go to a college and university in the US. We have to find a way to synthesize all of this great information and great opportunities because we, we're, we're one of the best resource countries, nations the world's ever seen. And I don't actually think it's about, quote, money. I think it is about our political will. It is about our political, do we want to invest in just defense or do we want to invest in our people? Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Jenkins, you spoke a little earlier about sort of some conversation about achievement gaps uh, nationally, and, and that's something that's been certainly a, a big part of the conversation over the past seven months is the potential for widening achievement gaps through this time. Uh, is that a concern here, and, and how can you stop that from happening? Well, I think achievement gap is one thing, but the opportunity gap, and based upon just even what you just heard, they were talking opportunities, right? And the higher, more wealthy families have opportunities before school, after schools, on the weekend, spoken language at home. It's so many opportunities. And when I said there's a resource with fundamental flaw, how we resource, this is what I mean. It's bigger than just money too. These opportunities we can create uh, for our children. And I'm still on the narratives. We have to shift the narratives. I said this when I was speaking at um, 
the editorial board for the State Journal. I think the media has a lot to do with shifting this narrative. And when I mentioned Shetty's work earlier or some other individuals who are economists or so-called authorities who are outside of education, on education, and they haven't come into a classroom, they haven't even talked to a teacher, they haven't talked to our children. They're gathering information, giving a narrative, and the papers run with it. The papers must start saying advanced learning doesn't belong to a particular group. You know, all children have an opportunity to be advanced learners. It's all about how we create engaging learning environments. You heard Mary Lynn speak, and I want to tell you, very proud of you, and I see so many teachers like this every day. But are we listening to them? You know, are we listening to the students saying, hey, this isn't what I'm looking for? Dr. Lassen Billings gave the four examples. When you talk about early childhood, that's a piece. I am big on early literacy and beyond. Looking at the science of reading and the science of learning all together. And then when we take that and teach children, uh, give children the best opportunities to become readers, give staff the support that they need there, then that open up pathways, which you talk about the German model, but that model too and other models, articulated skilled trades need to become back a part of our discussion. Renewable energy is big. We're talking about saving, how we're gonna go about saving our planet, right? Well, there are kindergartners, uh, preschoolers, parents, community. This is a serious conversation and we need to design ourselves as such so our children can too have that same promise of once they go through, and some states have done this, they put for a promise down in Georgia and some other places, what we just did in our state in terms of guaranteeing in, uh, household incomes of 60,000 that they could have this path now going to college. But it's gonna take a holistic approach and not uh, just a singular uh, approach to this. And I, I just believe that we can get there if we take advantage of the opportunity. The gaps that we were talking about is the gaps between black and white students. I don't think the white students should be the bar. First of all, their performance is not one that we should be bragging about when you're seeing 64% of white students, 74%. Why would I want my grandson to aspire to be at 64%, 74%? There's a gap between excellence and non-excellence, and we should be shooting for excellence around our country, and that's our aim right now. That's, that's where I am with that. Thank you. Uh, Mary Lee, how do you see the opportunity gap playing out on sort of a micro level just at your school and, and how has it played out during the pandemic? Um, being in the community that I teach in, it's, the gap is large. And I think that's where when we look at what our school's focusing on and how can you bring in what students are passionate about? How can you give students voice through what they are saying, guess what? Reading is reading. If they're reading about one thing that maybe doesn't align with your curricular ideas, reading is reading. And if, unless we are actually acknowledging those pieces, right, we, we continue to see this gap widen. So I think voice, student voice within it, I think choice. How are we incorporating choice within how we are teaching, how we are providing opportunities? Um, how do we limit choice? And who are we limiting choice to? A lot of times we think of, okay, well, I'm providing this opportunity, but are you really? And thinking about what are all the factors that go in for a student to actually access an opportunity when you provide it in a classroom? Does it involve coming in on a different day where they might not have transportation? Is it involving um, food where food insecurities might happen? All of those pieces have to play into when we are actually creating opportunities. I also think it's at a systems level and not just the school system, it's at the communities, it's at the statewide level of looking at how do we start making some real changes. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we've got time for one more question. And so I'm gonna ask all of you, what is the most important thing people can do for education right now? Whether that's a student, a parent, a teacher, a citizen with no direct connection. Um, and I'll start by going back to you, Mary Lee. So 
is, I had thought about this question when you sent it to me, and I wasn't sure how to answer it. Um, support. It's that public support, um, acknowledging that what we're doing right now is hard. It is not a perfect system. It is not a, a perfect space for all students. Um, but then also supporting that. Um, and in that same vein, asking for help. Um, I think that so many families are in a place where either a parent is, you know, both parents are working, a single parent is working. Um, how can we start knowing that information and building supports around that? Um, I think our teachers, if you can give them a little love, it goes a long way right now. Um, they are working tons of hours and are trying to learn systems that they've never seen before um, and to shift every week thinking about one new thing or another. So um, those are the biggest pieces. Um, and then, uh, you know, doing, doing your part and go vote. That's, that, that'd be the other piece. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jenkins? I, I think it's critical right now for everyone to become in tune with themselves because the more you can help yourself, you can help everyone else. And it's that analogy, being on a plane and it starts to crash, they say, grab the mask. First, get yourself under control, then help everyone else. And I think that is critical when we look at it, not only from an educational lens, but we look at it from an employment lens, we look at it from a health lens, the social emotional needs, and recognize that we will get through this. We've had tough times before, we really have, but never has it been so much attention paid to the things that have been historically wrong. There's an opportunity here to correct it together, drop the guilt, <laughs> move forward together. And uh, if something is wrong, um, and I mean, I don't mean it's wrong to talk about race because you should, but if something racist, call it that and move on in a discussion, correct it. And I think we go at it together, we all, we all will come out better on the other side of these multiple pandemics. Thank you, uh, and we'll end with you, Dr. Ladson Billings. Well, I've been saying this for a very long time, is that the biggest difference between students who experience school success and students who struggle has to do with the, the number of caring adults that surround them. I don't want to talk about, you know, so-and-so is a single parent house. That's not the issue. It is difficult to raise a child in this society with two parents. But the kids who are successful have, they got the soccer coach, they got their art teacher, they have their dance teacher. They are, they're almost always surrounded by a caring adult, someone who has their best interests at heart. Now, for me, as a child, I lived in a multi-generational household. So those were my caring adults. My parents were there, but my grandparents were there too. We don't live that way anymore. And so the isolation that far too many of our poorest children experience don't give them that same opportunity. That's why all of these other institutions are going to have to participate, whether it's churches, I mentioned that I was on the Madison Children's Museum board. They're gonna to have to do things differently to be able to surround our young people. So I'm just saying that we are learning more and more that human beings have some unique needs. And one of those needs is to be with and for each other. Thank you all so much uh, for your answers there and for being with us today. And thank you to everyone tuning in for listening to this conversation and supporting Cap Times Idea Fest. Cap Times Idea Fest 2020 is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors. Presenting sponsor, the Burris Group at UBS, a financial services firm with global access and a local focus to pursue what matters most for its clients. Major sponsors are HealthX Ventures, backing entrepreneurs who are creating value with digital health solutions. Exact Sciences, pursuing earlier detections and life-changing answers in the fight against cancer. Quartz, health plans built with you in mind. And Madison Gas and Electric, your community energy company whose goal is net zero carbon electricity by 2050. Co-sponsors are Epic Systems and the Godfrey Kahn Law Firm, 
Other sponsors are Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, Home Savings Bank, Unity Point Health Meritor, Cargo Coffee, and the Forward Theater Company. Media partners are the Wisconsin State Journal and Madison.com, WKOW Channel 27, and Hinkley Productions. Please consider becoming a Cap Times member. Learn more at membership.captimes.com.